Uh, it's uh, great to have Tom Mitchell here. To, for those who, of you who don't know, Tom has uh, been at CMU for many years, is uh, the head of the machine learning department, one of the few schools in the world has a machine learning department, which is a great idea. Uh, and uh, he has worked on a wide variety of machine learning and text mining problems. Uh, I've, for, uh, for a while, I worked with him on some text mining uh, work at uh, a now defunct startup. And uh, he, uh, since in the last um, you know, seven years or so, he's been uh, uh, looking at brain imaging and what machine learning can do to uh, under make us understand what those images tell us about the function of, uh, of the brain, in particular, the, uh, the, uh, how language is used in the brain. And that's what he's going to talk about. Okay. Thanks, Fernando. Good to be here. Good to see familiar faces and unfamiliar. Um, I tend to wander when I talk, so if you can't hear me in the back when I'm wandering over there somewhere, flag me or something and I'll try to come back. Um, so as Fernando said, I've been interested in, well actually I've been interested in a long time for, uh, in how brains work, who isn't? And uh, when I was a grad student, I even, actually when I was an undergrad to be more accurate, I thought maybe I should major in psychology so I could study how the brain works. But um, I thought about it a little bit and looked into it a little bit and decided it was hopeless because they didn't even have an oscilloscope. It, you know, the only, this was pre-brain imaging. And so really the only way to study the brain was to give an input and look at the output and then just kind of try to reverse engineer from there. It seemed futile. Uh, so instead I worked in AI for many years and then when I ran into Marcel Just, a guy who became my uh, primary collaborator about 10 years ago, um, he showed me this cool fMRI stuff that he was doing so I uh, got more interested in it and uh, we've spent the last seven or eight years working together trying to use brain imaging with machine learning methods to study different questions, but the primary question is this. How does the brain represent ideas? So we don't reflect on this all the time, but of course when you think of your mom versus your computer, uh, what it means to think about those two different things is that when you think about their, your mom, there's one set of neurons firing in your head, and when you think about your computer, it's some other pattern of neural firing in your head. And that's what it means uh, to be thinking about mom or computer. And so we're interested in whether we can understand things about that. Okay, so that's the goal. This is uh, work done with a bunch of people. The guy up there on the top is Marcel Just. He's uh, my primary collaborator. There are a lot of very interesting people involved in this. Some of you may remember Dean Pomerleau, this guy over here. He did some of the uh, interesting early work on neural networks for automatic driving. He's become uh, hooked on this stuff these days, too, and uh, we're collaborating very closely. Uh, so, okay, given the fact that we have uh, brain imaging devices, we're interested in, as I said, how does the brain represent ideas. To be a little bit more precise, um, when we, at least when we began, the very first question we had was, given techniques like functional magnetic resonance imaging, can we even see the difference in neural activity when people think about two different things? There's no guarantee that the answer would be yes, because even though fMRI is wonderful, it doesn't let you see down to the level of individual neurons and what's going on. Instead, a single pixel, we call them voxels because they're in three dimensions, a single voxel in fMRI image is about, contains about 10 to the fifth neurons. So you're not seeing anything like individuals. It's more like looking at a city, 10 to the fifth neurons. Uh, so the answer to that, by the way, is yes, or I would have picked a different topic to talk about today. Um, but then more interestingly, uh, is the neural activity that represents these concepts localized or distributed? Do you really have a grandmother cell? What about your brain and mind? Do we represent things in the same way? So there, all kinds of questions you can ask like this. Um, but in addition to just kind of enumerating things, it's interesting to ask, are there some underlying principles in the way that 
the brain organizes neural activity to represent different things. You know, if you look at the 50,000 words in English and the 50,000 neural patterns when you think about each of those words, is it just a kind of hash code of the, you know, are the neural activities just completely independent for each of those words or is there some systematicity? And we're interested in those kind of questions. Um, so, okay, maybe many of you maybe have already seen functional MRI, but if not, I encourage you to participate in an experiment. You can volunteer. Uh, it's a very pleasant experience. You just lie still in a machine, don't move your head, and think. And then we get from that a picture of, uh, th in three dimensions, of a strong correlate of neural activity with a resolution of about a millimeter, spatial resolution of about a millimeter. And the uh, temporal resolution is not very good uh, because uh, thinking happens at a rather fast pace. For example, if you read a paragraph, you read about three words per second. We get only one image per second. So if you're reading, we're not going to even get down to the level of seeing individual words. Worse than that, fMRI is actually measuring fluctuations in oxygenated hemoglobin in your blood and the time constant on those fluctuations is several seconds. So fMRI is very nice spatial resolution and unfortunately poor temporal resolution. So that's the tool that we started with. Uh, more recently, we've been looking at other brain imaging methods. I'll talk about that in a bit. But primarily here, I'm going to be talking about fMRI. Uh, so given that, we decided well, the way to study how brain represents ideas is to put people in a scanner and show them stuff like this. So in a typical experiment, we'll show people uh, some item and we, the instructions to the people are think about this item, think about its properties. If we show you the same item several times, please try to think about the same properties. Don't feel obligated to think about it differently each time you see it. That won't help us. And uh, other than that, we let people make up the properties that they think are relevant. So sometimes we show pictures, sometimes we show words, sometimes we show both. And uh, we space those apart, those stimuli, about 10 seconds. And as you remember, that kind of will cover this temporal blur of fMRI, blood oxygen fluctuations that are being measured. Okay? All right, so now given that, um, first thing I should show you is what does one of these fMRI images look like. So here's the image, or part of a three-dimensional image. Looks like four images, but I'm really showing you four two-dimensional slices of a single three-dimensional image. When this person looked at that stimulus that's up in the right corner, so a bottle. So this is a person's representation or part of their neural activity when they think about bottle. And uh, the top of the picture is the back of the head. The bottom of the picture is the front of the head. And as the thermometer on the right says, the red blotches are high neural activity blotches. So you can see that when this person thinks about bottle, there, is patchy, there are patches of neural activity. Uh, remember the voxel, oh, I should tell you, the voxels in this study are three millimeters wide. So these blotches are on the order of a centimeter or so wide, maybe a little bigger, and they're kind of scattered around. So now the next thing, I, first thing you should ask when you see this is, well, does it look any different than if they think about their grandmother? So I don't have the one for grandmother, but let me show you the mean image over 60 different stimuli. That looks like this. So it's unfortunately very similar to bottle, <laughs> but there are some differences. So if you subtract out this mean from bottle, you get this other difference image. And so here's the uh, summary of the activity that is differentially uh, associated with bottle compared to your average uh, noun, concrete noun that we talked about. And so primarily, we, when we do our analyses, we run it on this uh, difference image, because that's where. 
what's the average of images <coughs> Um, this is, thanks for asking that, I should have mentioned this. Um, we presented only this one stimulus for bottle, but we presented it six different times. And what you're looking at is the mean over those six times. And <clears throat> also when we present it, um, we capture an image once per second. And um, we consider only the images that occur four seconds after stimulus, five, six, and seven because that's where the fMRI blood oxygen fluctuation peaks. <clears throat> so this is the repetition, this is the mean of the repeti six repetitions of bottle. Yep. So that exists for a single subject, both the uh, bottle and the mean activation? Yes, so this is for one subject, one participant in the study. I'll show you some from other people uh, later. Um, okay, so then the first question, the first obvious question is, uh, is there information in fMRI to distinguish these different items? We convert the, all, all these questions into machine learning questions because that's, those are the kinds of questions we know how to answer. And so the way we convert that into this, into machine learning question is, can we train a classifier where the input will be an fMRI image? And then the classification task is to say which stimulus or semantic category of stimulus was this person thinking about when, they, um, when we captured this neural activity. And uh, so we've trained a whole bunch of different kinds of classifiers. I'm not going to go into the details. They're not as interesting as the neuroscience results, I think. Um, but we've tried a lot of different kinds of classifiers that you would want to use if you were trying to classify very high dimensional data. 20,000 voxels in a single image using pretty sparse uh, labeled data. We only have on the order of dozens of training examples and 20,000 features. So you'd want to use things like regularized logistic regression or support vector machines uh, to deal with the high dimensional sparse training data. Uh, we also do some pre-processing, for example, Sometimes people, even though they try to be cooperative, move their head a little bit. So we do some pre-processing to remove the head motion artifacts. Uh, we, we do a lot of feature selection because of the high dimensional data. So you know, in a kind of cross-validated sense, the program uses the training data to choose sometimes subsets of features. Um, so let's see, the other thing I should mention, because it's going to be important later, Your is another is kind off. of pre-processing yes, yes. that we do um, is to try to account for the fact that all of our brains have a different physical size and shape. And so at some point where we want to compare Fernando's brain to De Kang's brain, I won't say which one is larger, but they're obviously not exactly the same size and shape. And so we use off-the-shelf software to morph brains into a canonical coordinate frame. That morphing software is imperfect, my estimate is that it gives you a registration error on the order of a centimeter when you're dealing with voxels that are three millimeters wide. So it kind of misaligns the voxels so that they only are reliably aligned to within a couple, a, f a few voxels away. Okay, so when you train these classifiers, it works. Uh, here's a, uh, in this case we were training a classifier on what turns out to be one of the easier tasks, distinguishing whether a person is reading a word about tools like hammer and screwdriver or a word about buildings like Googleplex or apartment. And uh, I guess Googleplex wouldn't be a building, building 42 or apartment. Um, and uh, what you see here, each black bar is the classification accuracy for a different participant in the study. And in this case, we're training the classifier separately for each person. And so uh, since half of the stimuli were tools and half were buildings, chance level would be 0.5. You can see we do better. So yes, the answer to question number one is yes, you can train classifiers to distinguish at least categories of uh, semantic content in words. Yep, question? How, how big is the sample set was the question. Um, we showed each person, uh, wow, in this study, 
I believe the answer is that we had 10 buildings and 10 tools and that we presented each one six times. Question from a remote If office. not, it's that plus or minus one or two. Yes, question? Sorry, say that louder. Oh, right, I had on that uh, previous slide uh, something about significance level. Um, that's just the 95. Per so if you work at chance, you ex if this classifier was operating at chance, the expected accuracy would be 0.5. Um, but if given the size of our test set, if you wanted to be 95% confident that the observed accuracy was not at chance level, then there's a band of accuracy around 0.5 that you want to get away from. And the significance level that I'm showing there is a 95% confidence band around chance 0.5. You could do it with a permutation test. In this case, you can do it in closed form. It's just a standard binomial distribution. OK. Um, so I just want to uh, take a step back and point out that this is one of the world's fun problems to work on if you're a machine learning person. You can think of this as a case study of several interesting aspects of machine learning. We already mentioned sparse class classifying and training on sparse data. It's also an interesting domain, although I'm not going to focus on it in this talk, of uh, analyzing complex time series data. And so, for example, Rebecca Hutchinson is finishing up her PhD thesis at the moment on a probabilistic model for time series data that, uh, kind of like a, Bayes, a dynamic Bayes net, assumes there's some latent set of stuff going on that's hidden that's generating this observed time series. And it's also a very interesting uh, case study domain if you're interested in training many classifiers that cover many different instances. So for example, a different classifier for each brain. Um, I suppose at Google you have similar problems trying to train a different classifier for each user. Um, but, and if you believe that the classifiers are not the parameters of those classifiers for different people are not all completely independent, then there are interesting machine learning questions about, for example, can you use hierarchical Bayes methods to set priors on the parameters of the classifier to then use on subsequent brains that you train on. So the only way I could work up the gumption to not go into machine learning details was to include these three slides, so I at least got to point out what a cool machine learning problem it is. Okay, so now on with the main storyline, which is the neuroscience results. Okay, so since the answer to question one was, yes, we can train classifiers that at least can distinguish some semantic categories with reasonable reliability based on fMRI, the next question is, but what are those classifiers actually picking up on? So suppose that I uh, give you the words hammer and apartment, a tool in a building. The fact that I can get a classifier to distinguish whether you're processing the H-A-M-M-E-R stimulus or the AP whatever uh, stimulus doesn't mean that my classifier is getting at the part of your brain that's thinking about the meaning it might just be picking up on the neural activity that's detecting the H in hammer, and there is no H in apartment, and I could get the same kind of accuracies that I just showed you if it was doing that. Because obviously your brain, when you're looking at this H-A-M-M-E-R, it's recognizing the H, or you wouldn't be able to see that it's hammer, and then you're thinking about hammer, so what we're picking up in fMRI is some combination of all the things your brain is doing. And so uh, the fact that we can train a classifier that distinguishes whether you're looking at the word hammer or the word apartment doesn't guarantee that that classifier is actually capturing the neural coding of semantics. It might just be low-level perceptual features. So uh, question number two is how can we tell which of those is happening. And again, we turn it into a machine learning question. 
can we, one way to answer that is, can we train a classifier on fMRI activity when you look at words and then use that classifier to decode fMRI activity when you're now looking at pictures. And if we could do that, then it couldn't, if it can do that successfully, it can't possibly be an H detector because there is no H in the picture of a hammer. Okay. So we tried that, and yes, you can do that, and it works actually quite well. So for example, <clears throat> here's um, on the left a chart that shows the accuracy if we train on word stimuli and test on word stimuli. And on the right is if we train on word stimuli but test instead on fMRI data collected when people are looking at pictures. And you can see the accuracies are comparable in the two cases. And so that means the answer to our uh, question is yes. Okay. So this is pretty cool. What it means is that Really, this classifier is picking up on the neural activity that's capturing semantics. It's not just some low-level percept. Question? So instead of stimuli, you try different synonyms of stimuli. So are you still able to recognize the old picture stimuli? I'm sorry, you were mentioning different stimuli, pictures? No, different, uh, different words, uh, different synonyms of word stimuli. Oh, different synonyms. Yeah, synonyms. So instead of, yeah, right. Yes. Um, so is it like word-based or concept-based? I'm pretty sure it's concept-based, based on this kind of thing. Um, and you do see, it, you know, if I present the word glass and the word bottle, we get remarkably similar neural activity. So, the, the, sorry, I should repeat these questions. The question was about synonyms, what happens if people look at synonyms. And the answer is we haven't done that explicitly, but we've presented similar looking words, and, or sorry, similar meaning words, and found similar neural activity, so. Okay, so then uh, another question you could ask is about similarity across people. When you think of bottle, is it the same as that person we were looking at up there on the screen? And again, we can convert this into a simple machine learning question. Can we train a classifier on the people on the right side of the room and then use it to decode what the people on the left side are thinking? And again, the answer is yes, you can. So here, um, the black bars show, as before, the classification accuracy if we train on one person and test on that same person, other data from that same person. But the white bars show what if we train not on any data from that person, but instead use the data from all the other people and then test on the, this person. And you see the white bars are actually not that different on average from the black bars. So um, that's very strong evidence that the neural representations in our different heads are remarkably similar. Otherwise, it just couldn't, you just couldn't trade on these people and get it to decode those. And this is a very stable result. We had um, some people from 60 Minutes came to interview us about this stuff. And during the interview, we put their associate producer in the scanner and we showed her some words and um, we, we picked words that we knew were mo most discriminable, but still we gave her 10 different words and then we gave our program uh, 10 pairwise choices. Is she reading hammer or house? Is she reading tomato or toe? And it was correct 10 times out of 10, despite the fact that it never had seen her brain, didn't train on her brain, it was just uh, trained on other people that we had collected data from. So this really does work. It really is a stable result. And uh, it's, in some sense, the biggest surprise that uh, we had. So I have to ask, were they all native English speakers? Um, these, these were, primarily we use CMU students. And so they're, and they're not all native English speakers. We did, we've done some work with bilingual Portuguese English speakers and we found for those people we could, um, we didn't look at the cross-cultural question, but we looked at 
doesn't matter if we present the word in English or Portuguese, and we could train when we presented English words and then classify correctly when we present the word in Portuguese. So, uh, but we haven't looked at the cross-cultural questions, which I think are very interesting. We just haven't gotten there. Question? Um, were they mixed left-handed and right-handed? There is a mix of left and right, um, but we tend to use right-handed subjects. I think there are a very small number of left-handed subjects in here. Very small. So it, the results that I'm showing are dominated by right-handed subjects. Uh, the question is, have we uh, done any tests on people with cognitive impairments? Uh, none that we have uh, results to report on. We're, we're actually doing tests now on autistic people. Um, and it seems that their neural representations of these semantic categories are very similar, although there are also some uh, apparent differences in the neural activity that don't happen to be the coding of semantic categories. So um, we'd, like, we'd like to learn more about that. OK, so there's um, sort of where we got to. And by the way, this, this uh, last question and the rest of this talk um, is based on data we collected around these 60 words. So I just want to show you the 60 words so you can kind of get a feel for the diversity and the similarity of the words. So notice these are all concrete nouns of some kind. Concrete noun means an object you can touch. And uh, they fall into different categories. They're fairly diverse. There's, there's nothing special about these. Since then, we've got another set of much more abstract words that we've been uh, working with. But I just wanted to give you a grounded sense of what these words were. OK. so. At this point, uh, we were feeling pretty good because we had found out some things that we didn't know we were going to find, um, including the thing that neural representations are quite similar across people. But in some sense, it's kind of, uh, if you think about what you would really like to understand about how the brain represents ideas, what we really have so far here is kind of a list or a catalog. So for these 60 different words, I can show you the catalog of three-dimensional neural patterns of activity for each of those 60 words. And I can tell you that they're kind of similar across people. I could even show you some of the places where they vary across people. But basically, we have a catalog. It's kind of like in the early days when the astronomers, who is that guy, Kepler? Copernicus, maybe? The people, they were just cataloging the motions of the heavens, but they didn't have anything like a theory that would predict where the heavens are going to be tomorrow. And so we started thinking about the question, what would it even mean to have uh, more of a theory of how these representations work? So generally, when you think of a theory, you think of something that makes predictions. And one kind of prediction that seemed sort of the, the first one to work on is, well, we could say we had some kind of a theory if we had a computer model where we could give it a new word for which we hadn't yet collected fMRI data. And it could predict the neural representation for that new word. Now, if we had such a thing, that would require that we somehow figure out the systematicity in these different patterns, not just the list of 60 patterns for 60 words, but some kind of systematicity. So we thought about this for actually years. We were kind of bogged down in this. And the way you get bogged down in this is you notice, well, if I give you a brand new word about which you don't know anything, like Apple, then how are you going to have a computer model that predicts fMRI activation if, it, if you don't have a way to represent the meaning of Apple to begin with? So the way we got unbogged was we noticed that we could use statistical properties of the word in very large text corpora. corpora. And um, around this time, Google released the trillion token corpus, uh, I think primarily for use by the machine translation community, if I'm right, of uh, up to five grams in their counts. So we thought, why don't we 
try to build a model where we represent the, the, the meaning of the word in terms of statistical features of that word in a large corpus. And that way we can build a computational model that tries to predict neural activity in two steps. First, given a new word like apple, it will look up in the text or in the database summarizing the, the text properties statistical features of that. And then based on those statistical features, it'll try to predict the activity at each of the 20,000 places in the brain. So that's what we did. And uh, so the first question is, what statistical features? And uh, the answer we came up with was pretty simple, because we like to start simple. Um, so we made up 25 verbs. To be honest, I made, I, I made these up. Um, I made up about 15 sets of words um, and poked around a little and converged on these. But it wasn't a huge exploration. It wasn't like we tried thousands and thousands of things. Um, and the reason I made up these words is there's a hypothesis floating around in the neuroscience community for which we had seen evidence already that neural representations of meaning of things are grounded largely, largely grounded in sensory motor regions of the brain. And we had seen, for example, that when we show people those words about tools, that very reliably there's activity in premotor cortex when you read the word screwdriver or the word hammer. And premotor cortex is the part of your brain that's active when you're planning to do this or this. Uh, so there's an example of what uh, I mean by uh, the conjecture that neural representations are largely grounded in motor cortex, also sensory cortex. So um, you'll notice these verbs have a lot to do with sensing and motoring. See, hear, listen, taste, touch, you know, they, those were the ones my seventh grade teacher told me were the senses, the five senses. Um, and then a few more abstract words that largely have to do with your spatial relation or the way that you interact with an item. So I'm not claiming these are the Rosetta Stone, but these are the 25 verbs we used. Okay, and then the features we define simply as co-occurrence frequency. So given an input word like apple, uh, the first step in the process is to look up in the Google trillion token corpus data, how often Apple co-occurs with each of these 25 verbs. So when you do that, you get statistics like this, which, uh, so here are the, the word frequencies normalized to become a vector of unit length. Uh, the word frequencies for celery, well, the verb eat co-occurs most often with celery. And ride does not occur very often with celery. On the other hand, airplane has a different profile of verb frequencies. So indeed, these verbs do a pretty good job of capturing the meanings of these concrete nouns. Okay. So that's step one of the model. Step two of the model, then, is to train up the model so that once it's done, um, it predicts the neural activity at any voxel in the brain, V, as the linear sum of coefficients contributed by each of the verbs weighted by uh, how often that verb co-occurs with the noun in question. So it's essentially the prediction at voxel V is just the frequency of co-occurrence of the input word with the ith verb times some coefficient for that verb in that um, Voxel. I'm sorry, I should have said I thought. V could be verb or voxel. V is voxel there. I is verb. So it's just a weighted linear sum of those images. And those images are all the learned coefficients during training. So we have 60 words of data, as you saw. We did a bunch of experiments where we trained on 58 of those words. And then we kept two of the words separate, not to be seen by the learner. And we train a model like this. And the model has about half a million parameters, because for each of the 25 verbs, there are 20,000 voxels 
whose coefficients need to be learned. And you, it's basically a big multiple regression problem. Okay. So that's the form of the model. And now we can apply it on the two words that we left out and didn't train on. So when we leave out celery and airplane, you see on the top the predicted images. And you see on the bottom what the program didn't get to see, which is the observed images for celery and airplane. And you can see they're not perfect, but you can also see that they capture some aspects of the neural activity. So that's, the, uh, that's what the model does. And now we can start asking questions about, um, about the model and its properties. So, you can look at those images. It's a little hard to tell if you like the model or not based on these images. You can see it's doing something good, but it would be nice to be more quantitative. So first thing we did was a cross-validation test where we repeatedly train on 58 of the 60 words. Then we give it the two it hasn't seen, and we give it the two images it hasn't seen, and it has to tell us whether which one is celery and which one is airplane. So if it's guessing, the chance level, it would get half of those correct by chance. And when we gave this problem to the system, it got 79% of them correct. And again, we're training models on individual subjects, individual people. We had nine people in this study, so if you average the accuracy all over all nine trained models, that's what we get. So what this means is in three quarters, more than three quarters of the cases, if you give this model two words it has never seen, and two fMRI images for those two words. In three quarters of the cases, it can tell which one goes with which. So there's real information content in the predictions. This does include words in the same category. Now, we, we, I don't have the numbers here, but we also looked at the accuracy. If you leave out an entire category and then just give pairs of words in that category, and it's only barely statistically better than chance if you do that. Um, if you pick pairs of words in the same category, but you train on the other, there were five words per category, but you retain the other three, um, it's not this level of accuracy, but it's in sort of the mid-60s then, which is still uh, at least statistically significant. Oh, the question is, what was the accuracy for multilingual non-American? I don't know offhand. But when I mentioned the Portuguese-English training testing, the, it was roughly as accurate as if they weren't bilingual in that case. Okay, so that's one way we can look at the model. I think a more illuminating way is to go back to the learned semantic features. So remember those images of coefficients, 20,000 trained coefficients for each of the verbs? And those, by the way, were sol back solved by the training, right? We never showed verbs as stimuli to people. We only showed nouns. And from the noun images, the model solved for those. It hallucinated, essentially, the 25 verb coefficient images that I was showing. But we could go back and look at those and see what they look like. So we did that. And here for one participant were the learned coefficients for, let's start with the verb eat. So you see that blotch of activity for the learned coefficients for eat. That's in a region called right pars opercularis that some people in the some people call gustatory cortex, because this is the part of your brain that's activated when you taste things. So we never told that to the program. We never even told the program anything about physical adjacency of voxels. Um, but out of the data, there emerges this, um, by best fitting the noun data, there emerges this idea that nouns that frequently co-occur with eat will be represented using activity in gustatory cortex. And similarly, for nouns that co-occur with push, they'll be activated by activity in the post-central gyrus, which is 
essentially where premotor cortex is. And nouns that co-occur with run will be activated in this third area, which other people had previously asserted was associated with biological motion, with perceiving biological motion. So these were, I think, in some ways, we, we were very surprised to see this. We didn't anticipate this sort of thing, but it just kind of emerges from the training of the model. There's a question over here. Tom? We have observed uh, probing patients to make sure that when they make incisions, they don't uh, destroy parts of the brain that are important, uh, that there's a lot of commonalities across uh, subjects. Um, when you pick these words, eat, push, run, did you have those uh, uh, areas and ideas in mind? No. No, actually, after the results came back, I spent a lot of time, this is embarrassing, on Wikipedia, typing in pars of percularis and finding out what people had known about it. So, um, I mean, I knew that postcentral gyrus was associated with motor cortex, but I didn't know there, I didn't know where gustatory cortex was. I didn't know this thing about body motion. So, what? What was your inspiration for those, those words? Then? Oh, for those words, I was thinking sensory motor. And I, and I also looked at the nouns and I said, well, we got five foods in here. Eat is a sensory thing. I, I was going to put, I think maybe we have taste and eat. But I was thinking, sensor, I was thinking sensory motor. So that's why I put them in. And push, you know, motor. And run motor. I was trying to distinguish arm, arm motor from leg motor, so I put in push and touch. Push and touch and run. No, well, see, these, these images are images of the 20,000 coefficients learned by the model for the verb eat, uh, at least for one participant. And since we did this for nine participants, another thing I could show you is the mean of the nine independently trained models for eat. So we looked at that, too, and here's what it's looked like. So if we look at the average, not just the one for participant P1, but the average, you see very similar regularities across every, well, across the mean of the nine people. So here's even more evidence about the striking similarity in neural representations across our brains. Not only, you know, can we train a classifier on tools versus buildings, but when we train the model independently on nine people, the activity it associates with eat is very similar across the nine. Okay, so another kind of more fun way to look at what the model does. It's a good thing to... So one evening when we were feeling kind of silly, uh, we thought, well, we've got this model. Why don't we build a brain map? Every voxel in your brain we could label by the word in English that most that is predicted to most activate this spot in your brain. Right? So you can imagine this. Then you navigate around the brain and see where grandmother is, if, if grandmother is indeed in there at all. Um, so uh, we did that, but we didn't do it for all 20,000 voxels. We took 72 anatomically defined regions in the brain and just ask uh, which nouns are predicted to most activate different areas. So for right of percularis, you remember that's actually gustatory cortex. Um, the word in English, out of the 10,000 most frequent words, the noun that's most predicted by our model is to activate this is uh, wheat and these other words. Um, on the other hand, this region has a very different uh, profile of words. And my favorite uh, is left interior cingulate. But then if you start poking around in the literature, you see that people had previously published this thing about gustatory cortex, about biological motion, and left anterior cingulate, people kind of believe is associated with processing emotional stimuli. So here's another, you know, independent corroboration with, or converging evidence from, with other people, uh, suggestions about the behavior of the model aligning with that. Uh, here are another, some others that are kind of entertaining that I don't understand why cities, <laughs> especially Spanish-speaking cities, 
would be, I guess there are all kinds. Um, large cities uh, are predicted by our model to activate uh, less superior extra striate. I have no idea whether that's correct or false. Um, this one is interesting, and again, there is uh, previous evidence or previous suggestion that uh, this is a region associated with sexual arousal. All right, so um, let me skip over a couple slides because I have one or two things I'd really like to uh, get to. And let me just say, you can do an even better job of understanding what's going on if instead of considering the data from a single person when you're uh, making these predictions, uh, you, you continue to train the independent models for each person, but when you test the model, you, you get even higher accuracies, obviously, if you test by giving the two held out words to all nine models to predict the nine celery and airplane images, and then um, there'll be more signal uh, in the nine independent predictions than there was in one. And so when it goes, when you, if you ask it to compare the predicted versus observed data for multiple participants, you get higher accuracies than I was reporting for single participants. This is just important because in the next stage of the research, we got interested in, well, what really is the correct semantic set of features? Those 25 verbs were kind of successful, but why don't we explore alternative semantic bases for neural representations? And so we switched to using this kind of scheme for evaluating the models because we wanted to not be confused by noise in the fMRI data. So it's a little bit of a technical detail. Okay, but now the question is, you know, those 25 verbs are really a key part of the model. What we're saying, what this model is implicitly hypothesizing is that neural representations for every concrete noun you could ever think of can be factored into 25 components whose, that can be reassembled by adding them together in a weighted linear fashion to predict the neural activity for any word you think about. That's what this model is essentially hypothesizing. But we just made up those 25 words. So what about alternatives? So first thing we did was we did generate other lists of 25 words taken from the 10,000 most frequent words in English, and they don't do so well. So the red block over there is our 25 verbs, and this histogram shows the accuracies of other sets of 25 randomly selected words out of frequent words. Okay, so there's something going on here with our verbs. But then you start talking with people. Um, you know, people say, well, why do you use 25 verbs? Why don't you just use, say, the 50,000 most frequent words in English? We have 50,000 dimensional semantic bases. So we tried that. Um, the, the left column of numbers there called mean accuracy is the old way, the original way of evaluating things. The right column is when we concatenate the data from all nine subjects. Um, but basically, it turns out our 25 words continue to work about as well as uh, other things we tried. Tom Landauer is a guy who uh, is known in computational linguistics for being an advocate and an inventor of something called latent semantic analysis, which is running PCA on word co-occurrence matrices. And so he was convinced that would be much more successful, so we tried it. Um, there's a very interesting paper that came out in ICML last year. Some people did some multitask training on a large text corpus. We tried their features. So um, we're getting similar answers here. But, yeah? Try to choose specifically choosing verbs. 
in the histogram that I showed you, we were choosing random words, not random verbs. We haven't tried choosing random verbs. But the, the list of 486 verbs here is a pretty good list. And actually, I'm not going to mention this elsewhere, but I wanted to tell you, since then we've collected 40 very abstract words, data on abstract words like justice, love, anxiety, democracy. And um, we found that when we trained the model using those words, our original 25 verbs did not work so well. But if we use this list of 486 verbs, then it does work well. And so that I think the 25 verbs worked particularly well because we were working with concrete nouns. And when you start talking about having people think about words like anxiety, it's not as grounded in sensory motor regions. Um, it's 486 verbs that I found when I started poking around the web for lists of verbs. I'm a little embarrassed, but uh, since then, one of my colleagues who's more principled uh, has given me a list of verbs that are from a standard psycholinguistics database that are considered the primary verbs. But when you use those, you get very similar results to the 486. Yes? Yeah, if you drop verbs from the original 25, uh, it does go down. So actually when I said that I tried about a dozen things before converging on that, I tried smaller sets, I tried larger sets. Yeah, I don't think there's a verb that's key. It really is a kind of combination thing. But um, so, so I just want to tell you that we also, you know, we're machine learning people. Why are we not getting a program to learn the answer to our question as we did for our other questions? So um, we got interested in the question of just training a system to figure out what is the optimal semantic basis. Um, and so there are several ways you can do this, but fundamentally you want to set up the problem the way shown here on the bottom of the slide. We have corpus statistics. That could be, say, the 50,000 co-occurrence frequencies of the 50,000 most frequent words in English with a word. On the right, we have the fMRI data. That's 20,000 voxel readings. And now what we want to do is something like find in a common abstraction, lower dimensional probably, um, that uh, for which we can get a linear projection of the corpus statistics into that abstract space and then a linear projection back out of that into fMRI space, which is what our model was doing in the first place. It's just that we didn't discover the semantic features. We just plugged in 25 verb co-occurrences as the semantic features. So there are a couple ways you can do this, but and if you're familiar with PCA, it's sort of like running PCA where you have simultaneously two different data sets uh, that are paired. Uh, the f way that we found was most successful was to use something called canonical correlation analysis, which learns two linear mappings from the corpus statistics and from the fMRI up to this abstract space. And in canonical correlation analysis, you learn the mapping that maximizes the correlation between the coordinates that you get if you map the corpus statistics data and the uh, fMRI data. You maximize the correlation between those coordinates. So we did that, and um, we got the best results we've gotten so far. Uh, so if you do canonical correlation analysis and just keep the 10 most dominant features, then uh, by the measure that we actually trust more, which is the concatenated data, uh, we get slightly higher accuracy. And since doing this, we've collected an additional fMRI data set um, shown on the right in this chart, where we used the same 60 stimuli, but we left out the pictures. We just showed words only. And we got 11 new people and collected data from them. And so if you compare our original 25 verbs with the uh, 10 features that are derived from CCA, 
you can see that on across these 20 subjects in both data sets, uh, it looks like these 10 features do fairly well. So that's, um, I want to wind down because I know it's getting to be lunchtime and I know better than that. Uh, so what does this mean? I think if you take away anything from this talk, I would like you to take two ideas away. Uh, the first is something we didn't know before, but neural coatings of ideas, at least for concrete nouns, are remarkably similar in our different heads. They're not identical, we are different. But the amazing thing is that they're similar enough that these modeling procedures can extrapolate from one person to another. The second thing is really, uh, the second thing is that you can predict the neural activity in your brain when you think about a word based on how that word is used on the web. <laughs> That's exactly what this model is doing. The input to this model is how is this word used on the web, and the output of the model is the predicted neural activity. And it works. So there's something fundamental about semantics that's captured in corpus statistics. Computational linguists has, have, of course, thought this for a long time. But um, here's a kind of different twist on that story and some additional converging evidence for the computational linguist to, uh, to corroborate their idea that, that this really does capture semantics. So I think going forward, there are a whole bunch of fun things uh, I'd be happy to talk with you later about. We're looking at um, new imaging modalities. We're collecting data from MEG right now, which gives us one millisecond time resolution. This week, while I was out of town, a neurosurgeon uh, uh, helped me and our group collect some data um, by putting an electric grid on the surface of somebody's brain who needed this for clinical reasons anyway and that person agreed to collaborate with us and read these same 60 words and think about them so we have uh, different kinds of data that we're looking at uh, that I think will give us a new dimension of data to play with where we'll have millisecond time resolution instead of the five second time resolution that we have for fMRI. And once you get down to millisecond, you can actually see the unfolding of the awareness of meaning in the brain. So it takes you couple hundred milliseconds to look at a word and realize what it means. Uh, so if we can look at that every millisecond while you're doing that, we might be able to get some insights into how these representations are actually constructed. Whereas right now we're just saying sort of what they are and what's the systematicity. But it would be interesting to have a more causal picture of that too. So thank you. It's great to, uh, to be here.